if, if you're not humble, you become arrogant. When you become arrogant, you start to become irrelevant as mm -hmm. a teacher and your lessons start to die. Welcome to the Jamodi podcast, where we interview coaches and leaders to find out not just what they do, but how they do what they do. Becoming the best version of ourselves is Jamodi, just a matter of doing it. Today, we're joined by coach Gannon Baker, regarded as one of the premier basketball skill coaches in the world. Gannon has delivered his knowledge-filled energy, passion, and love for basketball and people in 48 states, 47 countries, and five continents over the last 30 years. He's created a systematic online curriculum geared towards helping players and coaches learn the game. Check out the link to his full curriculum in the show notes. Before we hear from Gannon, take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media at Jamodi Podcast. What's up, Coach? How's it going, Matt? Oh, man, it is. It's an honor to meet you. And golly, thank you for, for coming on with me today. Uh, you're welcome, man. Your name sounds familiar. So I want to, I thought we met each other before. Well, I, we I don't think we've ever met in person, but like as far as, uh, you know, coaching and stuff, I've, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, followed you, and, 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 uh, and, and you've helped my teams out without even realizing it down here in Texas. So, how about that? Yeah. Well, you're welcome. It's, uh, it's a privilege and honor. I mean, it's something that I had no idea that I'd be doing this long and making such an impact. But, man, you're welcome. I don't know what I did, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the game is simple and we all share. Well, so you know, not rocket science. I think as, uh, just as a high school coach, and I mean, I, I, I'm a former player, but golly, former, like a long time ago. And so, uh, you know, but uh, as high school coaches trying to get more into that skill development world with our players, and the one thing that you do is you make it really easy for applications within a team, you know, because sometimes you see a lot of things where it's just one guy going through things, but you incorporate a lot of movement. And so I can see things that you do, and based on our offense and what we do, I, the organization really helps me out. That's kind of why I started the industry is to be a liaison and an asset to the high school coach. I had a list of names that, like, I just I would love to sit and talk to and ask the questions that, like, I really want to ask. And you're up at the top sure. of that list, man. So sure, you, you ready to go? Yeah, yeah, man. Tell Coach Drew I said hello, man. He's one of my favorite people. He's the real deal. You know, uh, I, I mean, I know you remember uh, everything that went on back there, but I had played for Dave Bliss for three years. And then that summer going into my senior year is when everything fell apart. And uh, Coach Drew came in as a 32-year-old. And we only had six scholarship players and turned our program around with his relentless joy. <laughs> relentless joy. Joy in the Lord yep. is his strength. That's right, man. Well, hey, uh, uh, go Dave ahead. Bliss, man, y'all were converse, man. How do you know that? Man, I, 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 I'm old school, man. Converse you know, was my first sponsor. And, uh, you know, we, we knew all the converse colleges. Coach, we had thick, thick converse jerseys, man. Like, you could, those things, you could have worn them for 20 years and they would be fine. They were weight vests. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, compared to what, like, the sublimation and things now where you don't even know you're holding it up. Like these kids don't know. I could have probably been dunking if I had these new jerseys on. What's your favorite culture building activity? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, having the players or uh, the coaches, whoever I'm leading, have the students teach the subject. So, you know, if we're on the court, and we've been doing it for a while, whatever a while means to you, show up and have the, the players teach the drill, organize the practice, um, educate on the value or subject, you know, ask, ask them questions and let them teach and roll with it. Um, I think that's, that's my favorite, most effective way to help kids gain aptitude, which is the ability to learn and instinctively you know, get that information imparted in them. And with coaches, it's the same thing. You know, uh, I do a lot of mentoring and, um, you know, they're used to being lectured. They're used to right. soaking in information, but very, very rarely 
at least in my experience, do they say that somebody asked them to apply it like they were in school? You know, in high school, college, professors ask you questions in front of the, the students, you know, the group. And so under pressure, you have to loosen an answer and your answer has to flow and you have to articulate and you have to sound organized and engaging mm -hmm. uh, as all the values of a coach. You know, that's what a coach needs. So, you know, to me is, is having the, the students lead, you know, the class. And I just stand back in a watchtower and intervene and interject at the right time. So, so many players are stuck on quiet and, and, and a lot of the times we as coaches enable that and we, we actually keep them quiet because we dominate the conversation. And I, I love the fact that you set the standards and then you're going back and allowing them to reinforce and teach. That's huge. One of the, I think communication is a skill. Um, I think playing hard now is a skill, unfortunately. Hmm. And so as a coach, you got to be able to transfer that you know, that skill um, that you have because coaches work hard. Coaches are naturally communicative and, and you got to, you got to really work hard and study and work on your craft on how to, you know, how to transfer that, how to get teams because winning teams talk and touch, mm. you know, every great program I've been around NBA, NCAA, WNBA, uh, the great ones, um, their mouth and their tongue are enforcers. You know, their body language are, it is directors. And so they, they, they have a great way of, uh, getting things done and communicating, uh, through verbal and nonverbal language. And as a coach, you got to be intentional on bringing that out. Um, you know, I always say silent, soft and selfish actions, uh, kill a team's championship. And so that, that's part of your, um, player development model that you got to implement. You got to figure out ways to get kids to talk and touch. I love that. You, you said a second ago, you said uh, playing hard is a skill now. What are some ways that you bring that out in your players, that ability just to show up and give great effort and play hard? Great question, Matt. You the coach, man. I mean, you, you the coach. If you coach hard with enthusiasm and passion, then that's addictive. And uh, if you find one player on your team, hopefully it's the best player that does that, then you empower that player to lead and to hold the others accountable. But, you know, you can't coach what you don't possess. And so if you want your team to, vis to, vis to possess grit and toughness and hard work, then you got to be like a Coach Drew. <laughs> you know, for Baylor, you got to come in with joy. You, you got to sweat while you coach. You know, for me in the player development industry, uh, I'm I'm almost 49. I'll be 49 in two months. I still demonstrate at a high level. So I'm shooting with both hands. I'm doing the push-ups. I'm guarding. I'm penetrating, kicking. I'm passing. I'm showing uh, defensive coverage. I'm I'm clapping. I'm I'm uh, high-fiving. I'm sprinting to the next spot. I'm hustling after rebounds. I'm, you know, sprint full court on a drill. Like parents and coaches and administrators, they can't deny how hard that I work as a coach. So for me, I've never really had a problem with a continual lack of effort. Sure, I've had players come in and they, they didn't, they didn't really understand what, what hard work was or what my standard was. And, um, eventually they got it because number, you know, number one, I possessed it. Therefore, I could teach it. Number two, uh, time and score. You know, numbers are a great measurement for many variables. And so if you put a time and a score on a drill, you, you actually, they, they can't run from that. Right. So those are just two short, quick ways. And then, you know, the third way is film. You know, you can show them, hey, somebody on your team is harder. Here's somebody in your conference working hard mm. and then here's you yeah and so if you have you know have a cam cameraman or a film person that could show them uh, a picture because sometimes kids can't see themselves they're they're in the picture so they got to kind of step out of the frame where you got to take their lens and take them out of the frame so they can see that they are the Jamoni Podcast is powered by The Laser. 
the most advanced basketball training system ever created. It's designed to help players develop their change of speed, pace, and direction. This state-of-the-art and award-winning technology tracks every move of your body and every bounce of the ball, while it gives you video-based instructor-led guidance through over 275 signature NBA drills, workouts, and brain exercises scientifically proven to train the reaction time and decision-making for real in-game situations. For more information, check out handlefitness.com. Coach, you're, you're probably one of the most in shape 49 year olds or almost 49 year olds that, that I've seen. Uh, what are some of your daily habits that set, set you up for success? You know, man, that's, that's, I appreciate that. I'm humbled. Um, I, uh, I got a master's in kinesiology. So, I, you know, I, I went to school with a passion for wellness. Um, and in my industry, I, ha- I have to. It's not like I want to. You know, I have to, if, if I want to be the best I can be and, and ask these kids to go hard, some of these kids are uh, at the higher their softness, you know, they're, they're, they're such, uh, they have such low pain tolerance that I have to, you know, inspire them physically. So for me, it starts with sleep. You know, I really try to get eight, nine hours of sleep a day. Um, number two, I drink a gallon of water. You know, really stay hydrated. Uh, number three, eat right. Uh, not crazy. I mean, I had about 10 chocolate chip cookies last night. Nope. <laughs> I'm glad you yeah. said that, man. You made me feel better right there. Yeah. Yep. I have some uh, some light beer every now and then. Uh, I always try to have uh, one or two slices of pizza a week. So, you know, I'm not crazy. But I do eat my vegetables and, and I do try to eat grilled organic stuff uh and then three just sweat every day uh, i take two days off a week but i always try to sweat every day i got three kids i live nice. uh, about 500 yards from the beach so we uh you know we're active here in our family and then the last thing is man you know find something that you love to do um i have tremendous peace in my heart and, and as you know as a christian for the heart flow the issues of life and i want my heart to have peace passion purpose prosperity balance and so um i just try to pray to god to give me something that will bring him joy bring me joy but add value to others every day and i found myself praying for peace a lot and through through that holistic kind of physical and spiritual uh practice every day man um it keeps me young And, and you're a coach i think you know assimilation by association when you're around young people yeah you tend to have that childlike heart and you tend to, uh, you know, look at the world a little differently because you're raising up young kids, young people in the way they should go. So it keeps you young because of the joyfulness and, and innocent kind of spirits that they have and, and the ability to, to impact them so intently um, keeps you young. So hmm. great question, man. I hope, I hope I don't, get old but i know it's coming yeah no you'll, you'll hold it off and i'm 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 definitely uh i, I trying to trend in, in the direction that you're going of still being able to do some things what's one quality you see in leaders that coaches and players need to cultivate in their own habits um one quality of leaders the great ones that i see uh, are human uh they, they show vulnerability. They're not know-it-alls. They're learn-it-alls, as my mentor Kevin Eastman says. They uh, have the ability to say, I'm sorry, and they're okay with not being okay. For example, uh, I got to uh, experience what Greg Popovich was like uh, through my experience with Mono Ginobili. Uh, I got to be around Doc Rivers uh, for a couple weeks when I was visiting the Celtics. I almost had a job opportunity there, but I I didn't take it. But I I got to be around him for a while through Kevin Eastman, hearing the stories of Doc, being around Cheryl Reeves, WNBA world champion with Minnesota Lynx. Uh, One of my mentors, Dale Harris, I got to do some things with him. Uh, Mike Dunlap at Milwaukee Bucks. My point is I've been around and been able to experience some great coaches, George Raveling, Kate Slock, Nike. Nice. And all, and then the, my study, you know, the study, uh, I've been around Ray Allen and, you know, the workout, Kevin Durant, and, you know, 
live with Amari Stoudemire, Chris Paul, LeBron, like all these players, 100%, they want to be the best. But when they realize they're wrong, when they, when they, when somebody gives them the truth, they don't fear it. They accept it. Uh, they're vulnerable. When they make mistakes, they're accountable. I got you. I messed that one up. Let's go again. Can you forgive me? And, you know, among many values that leaders have, Matt, no question, a lot are important. But yeah. the one thing that I don't hear uh, emphasized enough is, is empathy and vulnerability. Because to mm -hmm. me, if you're vulnerable in front of your troops, in a, in a real, sincere, genuine way, that, that brings you tremendous courage and, and tremendous connectedness. Like these, these leaders that were vulnerable, their, their players and their people that follow them uh, respected them more because right. they saw that they're human and they're not a robot and they don't really camouflage, uh, their, their weakness, so to speak. If, if they make a mistake and then it affected the relationship in a negative way, they're going to own that. Or if they make a mistake and somebody corrects them, they're going to own that. And, and that's, that's how winning is done. Yeah, that authenticity is inspiring. I think that's a great reminder for all yeah. of us coaches, all of us coaches at yeah. any age, to keep being real. And, and, and like you said, it's okay that we make mistakes. I know early on as a younger coach, I did want to look and appear as if I have all the answers and I do not make mistakes. And I don't know, maybe that's with age, guys will get it, but great reminder for all of us. Yeah, Matt, me too. You know, I started coaching uh, Division One college as a grad assistant at age 23. And I uh, was a college coach for five years. Man, I, I, me too. I thought I had to be uh, perfect. I thought I had to be Superman in front of them. And, and uh, that, that was a little, sometimes that created a distance and a barrier between you. I think sometimes you have to admit you have kryptonite and you're human and, you know, what bonds your, your players and your troops is that, you know, we're all diverse, but we all bleed red and we all um, are human. And, you know, the common bond is, is we love basketball. And so, um, I, 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 you know, not in a negative way, but I just call it, don't be a controlling communistic coach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, be flexible. Be Hard open. to play for those dudes that are, are like that, for sure. Absolutely. So Absolutely. You, you do come across, I mean, you, uh, my first time getting to speak with you one-on-one, -on -one, I followed you a bunch, and but you do come across as, as somebody that you're really humble for all of the things that you've been able to accomplish and all the people you've been able to work with and be around. So as, as you, as you're, in your journey, as you had more and more success, how did you keep that? Well, how the ability to stay humble and kind of remember who you are? Um, you know, that's a great question, and I'm I'm starting to starting to really teach this as well, just as a reminder to me. Uh, ironically, Matt, there, there's some people out there that that probably don't think I'm humble. Uh, I've gotten some comments on my emails and, and remarks on Twitter, and again, it, it's a social media world. It's Sure. It's people, it's people that watch you from a distance, um, that don't understand <clears throat> the messenger behind the message and the, the process to the end result. So, uh, man, I appreciate that. But, you know, for, for everybody that thinks I'm humble, there's a small crowd of people that <laughs> think you're, think you're arrogant too. So, you know what? That, though, that's, that, that tribe of people that think I'm, I'm arrogant, um, that keeps me humble. Okay, mm. I'll consider that. Maybe, maybe that comment, maybe that blog, maybe that interview, maybe that uh, workout where I, maybe maybe I came across where it was uh, it was about me instead of the players. So I, I don't I don't answer to everybody, but I listen. Mm -hmm. I don't try to please everybody, but I consider everybody important, and and so I, I'll I'll have the the small voices. In my life, um, stay with me. I, I don't. I don't. If, if it's not true, and, and everybody's not saying it, and the core people around me, uh, if, if they say that's not true, then, then I, I keep those voices louder than the than the other voices that that say that that you know the opposite. Um, but for me, 
look, I'm not that important. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a player development coach on every basketball team. They don't even have one in high school. They don't have a player development coach. They have assistant coaches. That's right. So we're not that important. In college, all right, you, you might have a player development coach, but they don't get paid a lot. And in the corporate world, it shouldn't be like this, but people that are more important get paid more by the administration and, and people that, that own the, the program. And the NBA, they don't even sit on the bench. They sit behind the bench. So in our industry, Matt, anybody can start a skill business. Like I'm, you know, somebody down the street can, can be me. They just need a ball and a, a business. They don't, they just need a basketball and be able to communicate. <laughs> yeah. And, and accept monetary value. So to me, it, it's, <clears throat> it's a fragmented industry. It, we're not that important. And so I realized that I keep, I keep that in the back of my mind. Look, I'm just a small piece. However, when I show up, God has anointed me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. The tongue can bring life and death. I know I can impact a person's life in an hour. I really believe that. But in the grand scheme of things, the most important person in this, in this, in this industry, in this environment is the player. And then probably their parents. And then the head coach, and then their mentor, their assistant coaches. I'm a small piece, and I can impact for a season. But you know, I, I think about it's just perspective. I think yeah. about that. Uh, number two, I always try to learn more. Like early in my career, it was all physical. The second decade, it became mental. The third decade here, going into the third decade, it's you know what, emotional, spiritual. Um, you know, I've added faith more and, uh, being more, uh, evangelistic, uh, in my, um, in my journey, you know, um, I, I know that basketball is perishable for a lot of these kids, but their soul is imperishable. And hmm. finally realizing that, you know what, I can help this kid win a championship, get a scholarship, uh, make a team. But in, <clears throat> in reality, in the big picture, you know, is he going to have peace? Where is he going when he dies? How's his soul? Is he impacting the world? Is he, is he, does he believe in God? Does he know Jesus? Does he know the, the secret to life? Like, you know, your soul is peace is, is imperishable. Where you go after you die, uh, is very important. And we need to look at that. And, um, I know there's 18,000 religions out there. Um, I'm, I'm just asking people to, Look at the way, the truth, and the life. You know what I mean? Look, just just realize what kind of leader and uh, Jesus was, and what kind of God that we serve. And so that kind of humbleness, you know, uh, that kind of thinking, you know, being around people that are smarter than me, having a gratitude list, having a perspective, all of that, listening to the voices in your life that don't don't think you're humble. You know, all that keeps me humble. I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but well, that's a great, that's a great question because if, if you're not humble, you become arrogant. When you become arrogant, you start to become irrelevant as mm -hmm. a teacher and your lessons start to die. You know, so. Yeah, coach, there, there's a, there's so much gold there and I, I appreciate your, your honesty with that. I mean, I'm at a, I'm at a Christian private school and so, Faith is something that it needs to be and, and is expected to be infused into everything that we do. So any class that a kid goes to, there's a faith element to it every day in basketball. What I love about teaching the game is uh, you know, that just how easily life lessons pop up in moments where we can make, make this way bigger than basketball. Within individual skill work, you know, you just you had a big piece on faith a second ago. How do you? incorporate faith throughout workouts because you have let's say an hour with a kid and you have an agenda and things that you want to accomplish but how do you fill that or how do you incorporate that into it yeah um yeah, that's a great question practically number one we always pray before the workout and before i pray i kind of say look you know the game is spiritual for me 
And, and I, I don't just believe in God on Sunday. I take God with me. He's my coach. The Bible's my playbook. I talk to my coach through prayer. The game is life. Um, praying to God right now might not help us, but it definitely is not going to hurt us. Yeah. And I want a spiritual protection and connection in this workout. Do you mind if we pray? And I say that, you know, pretty much for the first workout and then the second workout, they get it. The third, fourth, by the end of the month, I'll say, Hey, <clears throat> TJ, you want to pray today? Even if they're not a Christian, man, it's just, you know, God still loves you, you know, and, and it's awesome because it's uncomfortable. Oh yeah. I was going to say that yeah. I'd love to see the look on the face right there. Oh, priceless, man. <laughs> it's pri- I-, I wish somebody would have done that to me. Yeah. You know, I was 19, 20, 18, because the only way to true solution and the only way to refinement, the only way to growth is through confrontation. Jesus confronted as teachers, as leaders, <clears throat> one of the biggest skills we're lacking because we're at an all time high with disrespect with authority and, uh, you know, students understanding information, but I have no idea how to apply it. And as teachers, we get stale and stuck and we don't confront and we don't dig deep. We just, all right, man, here's the, here's a book. Here's the film, whatever. I'm not following up. I'm not, I'm not asking the hard questions. I don't want to go there because it's uncomfortable for us. It's draining. Yeah. But to me, I love it. You know, to me, it's my gift. I, I, I grew up a fighter, you know, and, and maybe that's why some of the people out there think I'm arrogant because I ask the tough questions. I'm not afraid to fight. I'm not afraid to call you out. You know, it's, it's not being cynical or spiteful. It's called confronting negative behavior to change it. As a yeah. teacher, our, our nature is to confront. And so, uh, you know, there's evil out there that are distracting all these people believing in the wrong things because they're, they want peace. They want power. They want purpose. They want a vision. They want to go somewhere where they can be weak so they can be strong. Hmm. And, uh, and, and, and to me, I just think God provides that. I think he's our true life source. And the Bible is a book that's been you know, translated in, in, in thousands of different languages. And it's the one story in the history of the world that's never changed. Hmm. And you, you and I could tell a story right now on Twitter to 10 people, and it would change by the 11th or 12th person. And we're talking about a story well over 2,000 years ago. And so prayer is a start. And then during the workout, now this is hard because I'm competitive and uh there's a lot of flesh going on in, in, in competitive sports. Um, I try to be a witness. I try to be an example. I try to live out the biblical truths. I try to tame my tongue. I try to tame my anger. I try to be patient. I try to be graceful. I try to be forgiving during the workout. And then um, follow up after the workout. I might send them a sermon, a link, hmm. give them a Bible verse. I might invite them to church. And, and that starts the discipleship. Uh, after, uh, I get to know him a little bit, I might ask him before the workout, uh, Hey, Aaliyah, on a scale of one to 10, how's your soul? How's your peace? How you feeling? And, you know, last week I had some players tell me five coach. I'm under five. And so during the prayer, we, we prayed and I let them know if I can help you, I'm here. And, and that's that's kind of that's kind of what I do. You know, I, I've had the chance to to have a, a bunch of these conversations now, and it's amazing how um, there's so many moments where something that a coach says connects right to me. And you know, maybe I, coach, maybe the only reason that you and I are having this conversation today is because of what you just said, the intentionality that you have throughout mm-hmm. those practices. And, and after, I mean, I'm, golly, to be honest, I mean, I'm at a Christian school where it's okay to be sane and doing what you're doing, but I just don't know if I'm as intentional as, like, I'm I, right now I'm kind of kicking myself. How many opportunities have I missed? I know we're not perfect and none of us will ever be, but thank you. Uh, if anything else today, man, that that really connected with me and I hopefully it'll help me to be a better, more intentional coach in that arena. 
Well, yeah. Well, you're welcome. And, and, and God has divine appointments, obviously. And, um, you know, man, I, I struggle being intentional at times, too. Um, but guess what? We, we got today. Mm, no doubt. We got today. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So um, there's been hundreds of times I, I haven't been intentional. But you know what? I'm, I'm going to be intentional today, yeah. tonight. And so it's discernment, man. I mean, a lot of times, you you know, you want to help people. You want to say something. But you're not the person that God wants you to help them. You know, sometimes yeah. you need to, you know, give up uh, on people and, and let God take them. You know what I mean? Cause you, you're not the one that's supposed to help them cause you can't help everybody. You know? I would so, come home. I'd come home with some frustration at uh, times over the years. And my wife who is very wise would always tell me, Matt, you're not going to save them. It's not, it's not your job to save them. I got, and what a great reminder from her. And I got, it's almost like I need to have that on my whiteboard in here <laughs> every day. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't give up on people, but give people up. Yeah, that's good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, I, I've had to learn that, man. I've had to learn because I've been intentional, you know, for the last 10 years. I really started to step out in faith and be intentional. And there's some people I can't reach. Yeah. And but you're planting seeds. You're planting seeds 100%. and you never know. Yeah. hundred percent. And so, yeah, don't get frustrated, bitter, or lose your peace because the seeds you plant, somebody else will foster that. God will foster that. But you're, you know, you and I won't see the, the fruits of our labor until we're way, way up in heaven. You know? Yes, sir. And, I, and let me, share, let go me ahead. share a story real quick, Matt. Sorry to cut you off. No, you're good. <clears throat> you know, I, I, this is my 21st year of my business. And, uh, you know, presently I've been to five continents, 49 countries, 48 United States I've done work in. I started in 2000, way before the social media boom, internet. I think we had email. <laughs> um, I think I think websites were like $19,000, $20,000 for a basic website. So my point is, in the last six years, I've been getting hundreds and hundreds of messages, emails, texts, Facebook, whatever. And we've been saving them in a file of people that I've, trained in 2005 2010 that are now parents leaders coaches husbands wives and the impact that i made in their life they never have forgotten and they told me specific stories you were at my school you were at my camp and it's like wow i remember that i didn't think i did anything there and here whatever reason they, they feel they need to reach out yeah it's pretty neat man pretty neat yeah so keep impact coaches the jamoti podcast is powered by biology what's your bsa score the biology skill assessment is the only verified skills metric endorsed by the nia and njcaa to discover and develop the best talent for your team this 10 minute 100 shot test can be taken for free today on the biology mobile app elevate your game so let's let's take a little uh, change in direction. You know, at my school, uh, we really emphasize shooting the ball. It's a big part of our, our offensive philosophy, but then it's a big part of our daily uh, practice. I love getting to hear. It's like handwriting. Uh, different, you know, there's yeah. different different ways of handwriting. You just got to be able to read it. And uh, and so I love hearing people's uh, philosophy and how do you teach shooting in your program? <clears throat> well, number one. Uh, I evaluate first, you know, uh, they might be too old. They might not have great form, but it's productive. So I evaluate who it is and, and, and why they need to change. And once I make that decision, uh, I get them by themselves. So if I'm working out a team consistently or a group of four to six players, you can't work on shooting then. You can get reps. But, you know, to me, working on shooting is one-on-one, -on -one, and you just iron out the wrinkles in their mechanics. And so I I have about 15 vitamins, uh, if you will, drills. Some of them I've added recently because of my experience and time with Ray Allen. 
most of them, it's, it's, it's been my journey in basketball as a player. I was an ambidextrous player. I've so noticed that. I, I, you're probably the only person I've ever yeah. seen shooting uh, from distance with their left hand, but yeah, it, it, but it looks good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I broke my hand, uh, had an injury in my right hand when I was 12, three, four months. I just started working out with my left in my backyard and got the cast off, and it kind of transformed into that. And so, you know, in the game, um, we're going to do a 20 year, 21 year anniversary. And so they're going to put out some footage of me playing in high school and college. And you can see that left side of the court, left hand going right, pulling up right. It's pretty, pretty unique. Yeah. But, you know, through that, you know, authenticity, obviously I get players attention. And, uh, you know, so I've gone through the process of teaching myself how to shoot with both hands. So I have some vitamin drills that I put players through, you know, I watch them, we break it, we break down the stance, the catch, the release, and, and just kind of fine tune it from there. And then, you know, once I give them workout sheets, so I write specific notes, you know, like a doctor, I give them prescriptions, uh, customized for them. I film them. And then it's repetition. Repetition is the mother of success. Grit is the father of success. So grit is consistency, doing it when you don't feel like it. And, Repetition is the right way, every possession, every rep. So it's just that. And getting them and then, you know, once they get the form and, and they're they're productive and practice, then it's the mental side, man. It's all right, trust your work. And do it in the game. Do it under pressure. Do it when you're frustrated. Make shots when you're tired. Make shots when you're in pain. Make shots against good players. Make shots when your coach is yelling at you. It's that shooting it with tremendous anxiety and stress. And that's, that's where, that's where players struggle. That's yeah. to me, a lot of, uh, shooting problems comes from the neck up. Yes. Because yeah. Players don't know how to handle stress and anxiety. One thing I, I think I remember watching a video of you talking about 10 toes to the rim, you know, and then like everything out there, like even our, even our faith, there are some non negotiables, but then there's some things that are, you know, that people discuss and have different opinions yeah. on, right? Uh, with your feet, what are you still ten toes? And, and what what's your thought process? I've I personally feel like that's comfortable for me when I played. But where are you at now with that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, ten toes is is negotiable. It's just the standard. Uh, I still I still tell the players get ten toes to the rim, and and they're not they're never going to do it perfect. They're never going to be ten toes because if you actually get ten toes, then you're if you're right handed shooter, your your right hand is so I, I tell them 10 toes because actually as they do it, it, it they get five. Okay. You know, so, so if they're right handed, I just tell them 10 toes to the rim, get your right foot, right knee, right hip, right shoulder as squared up to the rim as you can. And, and, and that's all you need. I'm not a stickler on exactly 10 toes. It's right. Just the, it's just the standard. It's just the compass. And by me, because if I, in my experience, if I tell them, "Hey, square up your, you know, your your right foot or your knee," then they then they're almost pointed away from the basket. Now, some players, you know, a Kevin Durant or a Steph Curry can can shoot where their shoulders are not actually square to the basket. But guess what? Their release is clean. Their yeah. elbow is up. <clears throat> uh, their arc. You know, two most important things in a jump shot is arc and alignment. And the bottom line is if you get your elbow at the rim, point at the rim, you're going to shoot it straight. It's just if you get the other part of your shoulder, your hips, your knees, your foot squared up, you're going to be a lot more stronger. And a lot of these NBA players are so strong. Yeah. Their core is so tight that they could be facing almost 45 degree angle away from the rim, but their elbows I mean, Jordan used to pull up as quick as he could on a dime, Kobe, and he'd be like fading, and but his elbow was always at the rim. And so right. you got you to gotta think <clears throat> there's some things that NBA players and WNBA players do that you can teach, but some, you got to have the discernment and, and the common sense of some, some of the things that they do you can't teach. Like yeah. you, can't, you, you can't teach the way Steph Curry dribbles <laughs> and moves and shoots the ball to, to freshmen. And sophomores, even college kids, you just can't do that. So you got to have a sense. And so I'm, you know, as long as they're square, 
Yeah. They're, they're, they're left-handed, as long as their knee and, and their foot and their hip is square, they don't have to have 10 toes, but that's the sound bite. That's the sound bite because there's yeah. always some slippage, you know? Yeah, the, the outliers of the game, those dudes that are just on, uh, they're just so far beyond what is replica, uh, what you can replicate and, and the, the skill that they have. It's tough to uh, tell kids to compare themselves to that. But if there was a shooter in the league right now that you would say, hey, watch him, mimic his movements, and try to do what he does, who would that be? Well, he's not in the league anymore. I would say Steve Nash. Okay. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, uh, again, I don't study the NBA as close as some of these other coaches, but my answer would be J.J. Riddick. How do you build confidence in your players? Great, great question. Uh, many ways. Our number one way is getting them to, to fall in love with preparation, getting them to understand the correlation between preparation and confidence. You know, preparation breeds confidence. Think about it. If you and I do a motor skill every single day, like every single day, whether it's an hour or 30 minutes, eventually we're going to master that skill where we can do it with our eyes closed. This driving. Like you and I could drive a car in front of 8 billion people. Now, our, our heart rate be a little elevated. <laughs> right? 8 billion people watching this. Sure. But if, if we had to drive a mile down the highway, you know, make left hand, right hand, interchange, and stop. We could do it. Well, how? We're in preparation. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't get this. Like, and, and I tell, and, and I'm trying to be patient, but a, a player is in charge of their own confidence, man. I can't. Yeah. I can't jump in your head. I can't jump in your heart. Those are two things I can't control. I can't control your effort. Can't control your attitude. Can't control your emotions. But I can foster an environment where you can succeed in that. But to me, it's it's getting them to work, getting them to do their homework, getting them to prepare. You know what I mean? So it's it's videos, PDFs, lectures, parables. You, you teach, you demonstrate, you teach how Jesus taught. You expl- explanate, you demonstrate, you pray. Number two, it's um, catching them doing something right. Hmm. You know, find, find a little small victory. Don't focus on the makes or misses. Focus on the process, the mechanics. Give, give, you know, some coaches don't believe in this. I, I do. Give them praise for trying. I know Yoda doesn't like that in Star yeah. Wars. Do, <laughs> you know, um, do or do not, there's no try. There is like, no I get, try. <laughs> I get that. It, well, he was talking about Jedi, you know. Mm-hmm. So, heck, if you're in the NBA, WNBA, yeah, at some point. You're a Jedi, you know, you yeah. You want to win a championship. You want to be a starter. You can't just try no more. You got to produce. Yep. But the but the process. You know, we're not talking like you know at the beginning of the season. We're talking like off season. Yeah, those dudes All have right? already put in their ten thousand hours. So they yeah, yeah man yeah. So you know, in June we're we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. By by September we got to do it. So it's it's celebrating. It's being positive with that player if they're working hard. Praise that. Praise the hard work. Praise the uh, positivity. Praise the showing up. And then it's 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 being aware of their body language, their conversation to themselves. Are they negative? Are they putting dirt and darkness on their light? If they are, take it off. Have them talk positive. Have trigger words. Uh, hold them accountable if they're having any negative. Uh, behavior or spirits have them have a, a word where it gets them to the next play and just focus on that uh, make highlight tapes of, of practice and game and have them watch it look check their feed social media is probably the number one destruction of confidence because it's mm. a comparison tool you know what i mean especially instagram check their feed check their post where they clicking commenting liking where they reading check their music i watched uh, just out of to keep myself current in this culture, my wife and I watched the uh, Billboard Music Awards yesterday, right? And uh, and I love it, man. Tremendous artists, tremendous talent. But if you're not mature, you know, I mean, there's three, there's three, you know, pit, pits of 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 evil 
that we we saw watching that because kids watch that they're they're diving into the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye the pride of life mm. and that's what that's what the music and movie industry fosters right it gets you into thinking what 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 you look at is important what you f- feel is important and it's all about you you know lust of the eye lust of the flesh pride of life and those if you sin and fall, you're going to fall in those three categories, me and you included. Yeah. And 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 the industry of music and movies just uh, enhances that for kids. It's not positive. I mean, I, I saw more booty shaking and you know makeup and like perfectly structured bodies and bling bling and it's all about me and like man, come yeah. on, man. You know, um, it, it was, but it was, it was real and, and I, I, I enjoyed it, but it's not something that I'm watching every day. It's not what I'm, you know, it, it it's not part of my routine every morning, right? It, it's, and so I'm telling you, man, um, these kids confidence comes because the, the social media tries to discredit their self esteem. They get distracted. By the wrong things and don't stay focused on their journey and they make destructive to- choices because of that so the three d's matt you can tell your team this at some point don't don't uh, let other people discredit your self-esteem don't let the negative forces out there distract you right laziness fear people peer pressure drugs alcohol and then um, don't make destructive choices because of that off the floor if you do you'll never reach your destiny yeah. And, um, you know, I, I talk, I, I see that with pro, like a lot of pros come see me now at home overseas, G League guys, pre draft, high school kids. And man, we talk about that a lot. Like, you know, kids are good from 10 to 12. So you're working them out 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. or 3 to 5 p.m. But it's what do they do from 5 to 3? What do they do from 12 to 10? What's their routine off the floor? Right. Because repetition is the mother of success. If they're getting repetition with narcissistic and negativity and, you know, wasted time management and all that, then they get back on the court mentally and emotionally. They're not going to have what they need to produce physically. And so that's that's important, man. That's that's real important. I think that's that's a great reminder for for players that just. Because we we do, I mean, I know I'm guilty of. I I focus so much on what they're doing in front of me and what those what those actions and what those moments are like, but helping them to basically set up their day for success. All those other hours, and 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 the way you mentioned or, or talked about how social media can really, I didn't re- I didn't think of it that much as distracting from their game. I mean, I know the. You know, uh, comparison is the thief of all joy. And so I, I definitely get that. And, and that's what it, I have to keep away from that. When I see coaches with state championships, all over, yeah, you know, you got to you got to fight that daily. Uh, but what great reminder for players and coaches just. Yeah. Like, think about this, like time attacks immature people. But mature people attack time. And. A lot of the NBA coaches that I talk to talk about that. They're like, you know, these guys struggle on the court because off the court they have all this time and they waste it. Yeah. So my point is I've had players stay with me and and most of the day they're on their phone going through feeds of highlights or what this guy's doing and what LeBron's talking about or Sports Center, where Cool. Spend two hours on your phone. But you got to match that and spend two hours in a book, two hours meditating, two hours reading, two hours watching film. Hell, two hours stretching, two hours getting extra shot. Then because they spent two hours on the phone or three hours on the phone, now they don't have the energy or they don't have the time to spend that two, three hours extra that they need. Like, you know, if if you want to be the best you can be, you, you're doing three days. You're doing three. I mean, honestly, yeah. especially if, if you're short. And, and and let's throw the race card in there because the race card was thrown at me when I was younger. I was the only white dude in my school at times, the only white guy 
uh, in my high school and, and, and JV team, um, if you're if you're short and white, you got a point zero 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 one percent chance of playing Division One. And so you got to wake up in the morning, get your work in. You got to do something in the afternoon, get your work in, and you got to do something at night. Five days a week, take two days off. But it's like, you know, to me, the way I got a scholarship being short, and, I mean, I had 31 Division One offers, Matt. And during the summer, man, I, I was working on my game four to six hours a day. And a lot of that was taking notes, watching, you know, not my film, but like Larry Bird, Isaiah right. Thomas, John Stockton, DC, something called VCR tapes. <laughs> I, I lifted weights. I ran on the track. I played pickup. I had my skill development. I had my ball. I did ball handling sessions. I mean, it was, you know, it was four to six hours, man. And these kids now they'll work out with me at home, and then they'll come home and I think that's sit in it. their room. Yeah. And so that's I gotta it. say, hey, read read your book. Why the best of the best? Relentless. Uh, John Gordon training camp. Uh, Brene Brown. Um, Angela Duckworth grit. I got all these, and so I gotta like make them do stuff where they're on their phone. So that's what I'm saying. Hundred percent confidence has to do with how players attack time, time management. Preparation. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You, what you just said came right back to that preparation piece. And so many, I think there's so many uh, high school players, maybe even college and pro, but that, that think that they should be confident because they think that they've prepared. But that's the, maybe the art. And like you said before, of telling the truth and not being afraid to, to, or not, or not holding back from, from letting these players know, like there's somebody with your same set of circumstances could do way more. There's somebody out there doing that. Great example. So, you know, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Jay Williams tells the story of, of Kobe all the time. First time he played Kobe, you know, he gets out on the floor and Kobe's already out there working. And so Jay, like, man, he, he's already out here working, full out of their sweat. He puts in, you know, an hour and then leaves. And then Kobe's still out there working. You know, people go work out with Kobe during the summer. Kobe. You know, he says, hey, let's, let's meet at the gym at 530 in the morning. Well, Kobe gets there at 430, already working when they show up at 515. I mean, you either come an hour early or you're going to be a minute late. Like, I'd rather come an hour early than be a minute late. So it's it's that, you know, you think you work hard, then there's a Kobe mentality. You think you get up a lot of shots, then you meet Ray Allen. You think you have passion for the game, and then you watch a Gannon Baker workout like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah, that's the next yeah, level right there the next level yeah, in a baker yeah, workout yeah sorry that was a narcissistic <laughs> statement i apologize somebody will see that and say see, they, see i told you he's arrogant look at he's talking yeah. about himself in third person see? they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> cut, they're gonna cut that little piece out you just did it to yourself man yeah, yeah there you go you know so i got but no man like you know i you know i thought i was working hard and then my dad worked me out he's like that's how you work out I got you. You know, coaches come here and they think, you know, they know the game, and then you you inject something new and, and, and neat, and they're like, oh man, there's a whole another level. I mean, you and I could go sit with hundreds of coaches, and, and they, they would humble us because, like, oh man, I thought I knew right about leadership. I thought I knew about discipleship. You know, what I mean, they're like, so there's always another level that you can get to, and and that's. That's a constant battle with kids and, and preparation. But I, 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 anybody listening to the sound of my voice and, and hearing us today, parents, administrators, leaders, coaches, the best way to confidence is preparation, holistically, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. You do that. Um, Ray Allen said a, a great routine equals great results. Get into a routine. And then the grit, greatness resides in toughness is showing up and doing it every day when you don't feel like it. One of the things I learned from LeBron after a workout one time, I asked him, I said, hey, what, how do you define greatness? What's something I could take back to the young people? He said, consistency. He's like, learn how to do it right, love what you do, and then show up, do it every day. He said, greatness is consistency. Hmm. So all I right, said, I, I got to ask found. this. I, I, out of all the people you've worked with, you've probably had this question before. Hardest worker out of all the people you've worked with, who is it? 
Yeah, I get that all, all the time. Um, people w- would want to hear Kobe or Kevin Durant uh, or Maya Moore or Blake Griffin, but I'm, I'm going to throw this guy at you, and nobody will, will know who he is. But to me, he's, you know, Mark Stoudemire worked hard, but the, the one guy is a guy named Rodney Clark. You ever heard of him? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, you know, Google him. R O T N E I I. Uh, McDonald's uh, All American, Nike All American from Arkansas. Played at Arkansas, transferred to Butler. Five ten, short kid. Uh, went to went to Australia, became two time MVP in their top league. I think he's playing over in Europe now. But he was the hardest worker. Wow. I've ever had in my life. Like he worked harder than me as a coach. And I had him when I was in my, you know, early 30. So I was at the top of my physical game as <laughs> yeah. a coach. And he was just relentless, like effort, attitude, sweat. He went through three or four outfits in, in 90 minutes, two pairs of shoes. Mm. At times he would go so hard that his feet would bleed. Like you could just feel the vibration of his intensity as his feet was on the floor, as he pounded the ball, he, he grunted like Rocky. Um, he would talk to himself, you know, and he was efficient. Like he had Damian Lillard range, but 5'10", play in the SEC, play the Butler, like dude overcame the ice, should have been a jockey, <laughs> you know, and, and, and for the equestrian sport. But just – um I just had no words for him. So it was more of encouragement and man, can we do better? And, you know, just teaching him, Hey, here's the read off a pick. It was just superficial surface stuff to enhance what he did. But, you know, you just, gosh, if everybody had a motor like him and Kobe had that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But again, I wasn't Kobe's trainer. I was, you know, wasn't uh, with him that long to really experience his work ethic. Amari had that, but you know, Rodney worked harder, man. Yeah. Um, but see, that's inspiring, Jared. though. That's inspiring, though. The, like, here's here's a guy that, I mean, you've worked with thousands of players, and here's a guy that probably we yeah. wouldn't know or hear about, but he made an impact on you with yeah. – it's, it's exactly what you were saying early on about how you can impact others with your approach and how you show up every day. And then as players, you know, they, they can do that too. 100%. He inspired me, and, um, you know, that's why he's still playing. That, that's why – He's, you know, he, he was a Christian, and um, I asked him, well, "Why do you?" you know, I, I knew why, but I always like to hear people's why. Yeah, yeah. That's why, as a coach, you know, um, there's no value in the obvious. So ask people questions, even though you know the answer, because they're not going to give you the, the obvious. They're going to give you their why. And his authenticity was, was was awesome because he said, the reason why I go so hard is so I can have peace. Because mm. if I go as hard as I can, there's nothing else I can control. I've done everything else I can do. I got to – and, boy, if, if that's not faith, right, do the yeah. best with what – and this is not in the Bible. I'm sure there's an interpretation, and you can make a sermon out of it because <laughs> – your Christianity is on another level than mine, but I doubt that. But yeah, you know, you know, do the best you can with what you got, and God will honor with what you bring. Yeah, you know what I mean. So I always, and my grandma uh, will always told me that. Look, if you do your best, God will bless the rest. Yep. Yeah. You know my mean? mom, my so, mom had that same uh, same quote with me. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. And that's what Rodney was saying is like, yeah. you know, if, if you go so hard, you know what? That's a that's a great way to battle anxiety and, and nerves because yeah. what more can you do? And so you're like, look, if I fail, then I fail. I'm doing the best I can. And people surprise themselves. Yeah. Because guess what? Your best is darn good enough. Not for the NBA, Rodney. But dad going, man, two-time MVP, making $250,000 in Europe working out four hours a day, seeing the world, tremendous peace, you know, five, 10 white dude, what a, what a testimony you can be to people yep. that, that think they're too small or too, too white or too rich or too poor to do something. Success is colorblind and gender free. Mm. So don't you dare let people in titles and stats 
right? Limit yeah. you because do your best and God will bless the rest. Let's go, man. man. We're preaching, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. It's a, Let's go. It's a great. What do you want? That coffee? You got coffee going? You coffee drinker? I got, I got yeah, I got, got some latte. There you go. Little, there you go. Almond milk. I feel it. I feel the, I feel the, you, know, you don't need it though. But I think that that mentality though is a great way. Like what I want for my sons, what I want for my players is to live without regret. Like to look back and feel it. I mean, you're yeah. probably that way. I feel that way about my playing career is like the one thing that I feel like I actually did well was my approach to the game. Uh, but living without that regret, how many guys do you hear, man, I wish I would have put in more time. I wish I would have, you know, so I, I love that mentality that he had. The Jamoti podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. What's one thing you would do differently if you could start over in coaching? Be more empathetic, more patient, mm. meet meet my players and, and coaches that I was mentoring where they're at and un understand where they're coming from a little more. And so to do that, do more research, studying, I would have written my mental, emotional, spiritual curriculum and, and how I deliver those tools earlier. I have that now. Like I have a holistic curriculum now. All paper, we study, we're intentional how we teach it in our classes. But I would have done that a lot sooner because I think the problems mentally and emotionally and spiritually that players have now, I mean, they had in the year 2000. Yeah. They had in the, in the late 90s when I was coaching. I started coaching in, in 1996. So it's just with social media, um, it's brought to the surface and, you know, it's cleared the air, so to speak. So now people are more comfortable talking about it because they know many people in the world are. So you're not ostracized mm. about talking about uh, your life and, and what's going on and the depression and anxiety and uh, insecurity and insignificance that you may feel and the mental uh, health that, that you're, it's not very well with you right now. Um, we have as a coach, we got to deal with that. I mean, unless you're just a coach that just teaches moves and counters and, you know, you want to make your program uh, well off because of the content and you're, you're all about the digital marketing out there that brings in a lot of money to your program or your business. You know, I mean, quite frankly, that, that's why a lot of coaches uh, coach because they can make a lot of money with their program if they just, you know, keep it respectable with winning. They don't have to worry about the players. They can just let their parents raise them or let their, you know, guardians raise them and they, they don't have to touch them, but they can, you know, put on the facade that the program is doing well because we win and man, we make a lot of money and yeah. I'm popular and got the shoe contracts and all that. But as coaches, I think, you know, if, 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 you, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, you know, we have a responsibility to help these players be great human beings, to be living trophies, to be leaders as spouses, as people, right, as leaders. And um, I just think they need to be living trophies, if you will. I'll steal that from my friend Kevin Sutton. But, you know, our responsibility is to teach winning. H how do we win and, and transfer that into them so they can go win in life? And to do that, you got to really be in tune with the mental and the emotional side of, uh, of skill sets yeah. that you can, you can teach. I love that living trophies piece. I'm I'm definitely gonna gonna steal that. And I think yeah. uh, as coaches, a great question is to make sure we know what our why is and and to be where our feet are, and not constantly looking at what's next or and not looking at our players as almost as what can they do for me or what can I accomplish through them. Um, so thank you for that reminder for sure. Yeah, yeah uh, it's hard. It's hard, Matt. I mean, if you want to make an impact, be ready for a headache. Mm. Be ready to be tired. It's hard. It's hard to change behavior, change lives, but it's so rewarding. All right, coach, the speed round. 
30 seconds or so, small questions, blurt out the first thing that comes in your mind. Uh, this might be rated R, Max. I mean, you, you, don't, you won't want to know what's going through my mind at times, man. I'll, but I I'll guess get, that's the world of editing. I'll get some bleep buttoners. No, it'll be good. All right, first thing. Favorite ice cream flavor? Cookie dough. For high school, shot clock or no shot clock? Shot clock, man. Thank you. Texting or talking? Talking. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Invisibility or super strength? Super strength. Place you most want to travel? Um, Hawaii. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Three. <laughs> How many hours of sleep do you need? Seven. Okay, last one. This is probably the most important. Godfather or Star Wars? <sighs> Star Wars, man. Coach, I'm so I'm so glad you said that because it, here's the fun. You used the Yoda quote earlier on, so I felt yeah. like I knew. But so many coaches, I think, I think they're closet Star Wars. Like they they know they love that, but because they're a coach, they got to say Godfather. But I'm a Star Wars guy too. You know, two great series. Um, but to me, life is is the Force, man. You know, life is good versus evil. You got. Good basketball versus bad basketball. I mean, but I know the Godfather is the same. But I, I just the, the Star Wars makes it such such a clear, you know, interpretation of that. That I gotta it. go with Star Wars, man. Well, hey, man, like, <laughs> Coach, thank you, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Like I know you're busy, but you know it's it's fun to people that you get to watch and listen to, and you know, and you kind of form an idea or about who they are just from what you see or what you yeah. hear. But man, when it's uh, when it lines up and, and these guys are the real deal, like you, that's awesome. Well, I hope so, man. Thank you. Uh, I'll take that as a compliment. I, I try to, um, you know, portray on online who I really am. I mean, everything we put out is the truth. There's no gimmicks or manipulation. Uh, obviously, my passion might push some people away, but I love the game. I love life. I love God. You know, it's a great day, man. Let's get after it. I mean, that's my attitude. So, Matt, it's, it's an honor. I'm, I'm sorry we had to um, – took a while for us to get on. but No, you're good. You're good. It, anything you need, let me know. And, and I think what you're doing is great. You asked some very relevant questions, and I felt I got better today. Oh, man. So, uh, thank pleasure. You, thank you for giving me the platform. Pleasure was mine. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast – Share it with your fellow coaches and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.